Welcome to the 78th theoretical physics colloquium by Professor Andrew Steiner from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville and the physics division of the Oak Ridge National Lab. He got his PhD in 2002 from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Uh, after that, he had uh, several postdoctoral positions at the University of Minnesota, Los Alamos, and um, joined Institute for Nuclear Astrophysics at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab and the Department of Physics and Astronomy of Michigan State University. He uh, became a research assistant professor in 2011 at University of Washington. And finally, he moved to the University of Tennessee and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab in 2014, where he is now an associate professor. Over the years, he received several uh, notable awards. That includes the Dissertation Award in Nuclear Physics from the American Physical Society in 2004 and a Senior Research Award from the University of uh, Tennessee in 2019. His research interests include nuclear astrophysics, properties of neutron stars, neutron star mergers, equation of state of hot and dense matter, quark matter, superfluidity in dense matter, cooling of neutron stars, many other things. And today he will be talking about multi-messenger astronomy and the physics of hot and dense matter. And with that, I'll give the microphone to you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, um, Igor, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, so I'll, um, again, I'll talk about uh, the hot and dense matter. Um, I want to acknowledge I have uh, several excellent collaborators, uh, in particular for the work that uh, I will uh, talk about today. Um, I want to highlight uh, my uh, previous graduate students, Mohammed Al Mamoun, Spencer Boulogne, Xing Fu Du, my current uh, graduate students, uh, Anik Hassan and Saejit Roy, my previous postdoc, Sophia Han, um, she worked on this work to, that I'll speak about today also, and my current graduate student, Zidu Lin. Uh, and then uh, many excellent people have, have contributed. And of course, this work would not be possible with, without them. So um, just in terms of an outline of what I will talk about today, just a brief introduction on neutron stars and a somewhat myopic view of the last decade uh, on the nature of hot dense matter and its relationship to neutron stars. I'll talk about the nuclear physics input for uh, core collapse supernovae and neutron star mergers, and uh, then pull it, put it all together at the end, I'll talk about NP3M. So as Igor mentioned, please feel free to ask questions or interrupt at any time. I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to address whatever your questions, clarifications uh, that, that you have. Okay, so to begin with the neutron star introduction, so what are neutron stars? Neutron stars are the final state in the evolution of normal stars or mean sequence stars between about eight and 20 times the mass of the sun. So this is a, a diagram I've copied from one of my uh, collaborators, uh, Danny Paj. Um, so this is a, an open source Python version of this figure, just sort of summarizing what's going on in the neutron star. But principally for, for today, I'm just gonna focus on the core. And the core is neutrons, protons, and electrons in the outer core. And the inner core is a big question mark. Okay, this is one of the holy grail questions of neutron star science. What are the, the fundamental degrees of freedom and their properties in, in the uh, insides of neutron stars? Okay. Um, so sometimes I think of myself as a nuclear structure theorist. I study the 10 to the 57 mass region. So neutron stars are, are much like giant nuclei in that sense. And, and this, is, this is an analogy which actually leads to, to physics results um, as you might have seen elsewhere. Um, another important simplification when describing neutron stars, they're, they're dense, but they're cold in the sense that matter is degenerate. The minimum chemical potential of any particle, be it neutrons, protons, or electrons in the core is about 20 MeV. And that's much, much larger than the temperature. So uh, for the entire neutron star life, all particles are degenerate all the time. And uh, what this means is this means that uh, unless you have some process, like uh, you're in the middle of a core collapse or you're in the middle of a neutron star merger, then you can, uh, you can almost take the T equals zero limit. 
Okay, um, or at least you can you can use the de degenerate approximation. So that's a quick introduction to neutron stars. Um, so for in this uh, t equals zero limit, there's uh, the nature of matter, and the center is described by the equation of state. And because the because the temperature is zero, you can think of the equation of state is just pressure as a function of the energy density. Um, P is a function of epsilon. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this equation of state of dense matter and the neutron star mass radius curve. It turns out that uh, to a good approximation, all neutron stars in the universe lie on this universal mass radius relation, neutron star mass radius curve. And of course, there's, and there's this one-to-one -one correspondence with the equation of state. So it makes sense that, you know, if you know something about the equation of state from the laboratory at low densities, but you don't know what's going on at high densities, then you can imagine using neutron star observations. If you have uh, mass and radius observations, then you can, these end up as sort of dots or blobs and you can connect the dots and then you can take advantage of this one-to-one -one correspondence to learn about the equation of state at high densities. Um, attempts to make this connection go back 60 years to, to Cameron. And we are only, only now in the, in the past 10 or 15 years, really um, quantitatively making this connection and doing this to learn about the, the equation of state of high density matter. Okay, so to uh, let's roll back to about 2007. What was the status of neutron star mass radius curves uh, again, this is a, something which is uh, in some sense fundamental because it describes to a, uh, to a good approximation all the neutron stars in the universe must lie somewhere on this curve. If you have, um, if you understand quantum chromodynamics and you can, and you know the correct degrees of freedom and you can compute the equation of state, then you can use that one-to-one -one correspondence and compute what this curve is. Obviously, we can't do that yet. Uh, but what was the what was the state of the art in 2007? Well, this is um, a article uh, figure from an article by um, Jim Landmer and Prakash, who, uh, as Igor mentioned, just uh, won the Beta Prize. Um, so I think they're probably both Beta Prize winners by now. The uh, so the um, so this is this is the state of the art in 2007, right? That um, radii are you know, somewhere between eight and 15 kilometers. Uh, anything in the gray region is allowed. Um, the green and blue regions are, are ruled out, um, either because of causality or, or some kind of observations, but this is the sort, of, the sort of state of the art. And there is a lot of variation, a lot of different theoretical models, a lot of different uh, assumptions about QCD, which are built into these various theoretical, these various mass radius curves. So, um, Fast forward only three years, and now we start to get actual uh, neutron star observations, in particular, um, radius information is what, what critically uh, advanced the field at this time. And so, for, for example, for one particular neutron star in 4U 1820-30, this is, uh, this is the, the sort of dot that we want to connect, okay? So we have, uh, we have six dots that look something like this. And this resulted in a neutron star mass radius curve, which um, radii between, sorry for the typo, 10.4 and 12.9 kilometers, much, much advanced from the sort of eight to 15 kilometers only three years earlier. But then um, much more significantly in 2010, there was an observation of a two solar mass neutron star. And so this is a horizontal line, okay, which, um, which goes through the mass radius plane. And it's a very strong constraint because it means that the mass radius curve must go high enough to cross this horizontal red line, okay? And, um, and that, it turn, that it turns out that also is, is sort of compatible with this 10.4 to 12.9 kilometer uh, radius range. And so this is new information on the equation of state. And as we learn about the neutron star mass radius curve, we're learning about the equation of state of, of dense matter. So um, normally you would 
uh, presume, for example, that, that the neutron star uh, consists of neutrons and protons. And so you, you uh, take a nucleon, we cannot do QCD directly, right? So we uh, presume some nucleon-nucleon interaction. We use some quantum many-body method uh, to compute the equation of state. Uh, and then we can make a prediction for the neutron star mass radius curve. And that's the, the way the process goes. Uh, however, you can take advantage of Bayesian inference, and uh, which was uh, previously referred to or historically referred to as inverse probability. And you can use the, the, the neutron star observations to go backwards to infer for example, the parameters of your nucleon nucleon interaction. And so uh, there have been lots of, lots of different ways of doing this over the years. In 2012, we uh, used neutron star observations to constrain a particular parameter uh, or a quantity related to the nucleon nucleon interaction, uh, this parameter called L. This is the density derivative of the nuclear symmetry energy. So just to define this, Briefly, this is the energy per as a function of baryon density of just neutron matter. So just put neutrons in a box and the baryon density then of that box is just the number of, bar number of neutrons per unit volume. And so then there's some energy associated with all the neutrons in the box, okay? Now think of a different box now we're going to fill this box instead with equal numbers of neutrons and protons. And we call that nuclear matter because it's something close to the central, the, the center of a, of a nucleus. And that, that box, there's also some energy associated with the, um, as a function of the baryon density in that box. The symmetry energy is just the difference, uh, approximately the difference between these two energies. And then L is approximately the, the derivative of this function you can imagine changing the density of the box either by adding particles or changing volume, right? And so this symmetry energy is some function of density and then you can take the derivative. So, okay, having defined that quantity L, what is the, what do the neutron star observations say? Well, they say that this quantity L is between about 40 and, and 60 MeV within some uncertainty. And it turns out that in, in 2012, this was, uh, more or less consistent with other constraints on L, except uh, possibly from, from uh, constraints on L from isobaric analog states, but actually later that, that, that range actually came down. And so that suggests smaller, and in 2012, that suggested smaller values of L. Of course, now we have other constraints on L, either from theory or, or experiment from PREX. The, the picture is, still, is somewhat unclear, but, uh, but this is the, at least a good demonstration of the kind of, an example of the kind of thing you can do. You can learn about uh, the nucleon-nuclear interaction, um, especially at high densities from neutron star observations. Andrew? Yes. Quick question, at which NB density is that defined? To be yeah. Thank you. That's that's an excellent question, and I didn't specify this. This um, value of L is defined in particular at the nuclear saturation density, okay. which is just the um, for to review. That's just the uh, the density in the center of nuclei. Right. Okay. So. Um, uh, excellent question. Please let me know if there are others. So uh, for one year, okay, well, if we know something about neutron star observations and we know something about the equation of state, then of course the equation of state is a critical input in modeling core collapse supernova in um, 2013. And even to, to some extent today, we're trying to understand the explosion mechanism for core collapse supernova. So we uh, endeavored to create a new equation of state for, for core collapse supernova uh, designed to match these new constraints on the neutron star mass radius curve. So the, the red and, and green regions here show the constraints on the mass radius curve as we created as SFHO and SFHX, thinking that maybe that would, that would change something for core collapse. And what was the result? Well, nothing, okay? There's no significant input uh, impact on, um, for example, the explosion mechanism for, for core collapse supernova, okay? Well, that's okay. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, it's certainly the case that we want to, you know, 
update our nuclear physics input for core collab supernova. So, okay, hold that thought. Let's see what happens over time. Um, so, uh, of course, in 2015, we were all thinking, we were all uh, uh, fantasizing about uh, all sorts of mergers. LIGO had discovered a uh, black hole, black hole merger. And so it was worth thinking about neutron star mergers at this time. Um, so in a neutron star merger, the nearby neutron star creates a tidal force on the other neutron star. And LIGO had thought about measuring the so-called tidal deformability, the, the extent to which a neutron star is deformed by the presence of a nearby neutron star, um, a squishiness if you like, right? And it's clear that this squishiness, this tidal deformability is correlated with the radius. If the radius is large, you have a very bloated star, it's very squishy, it's very easily deformable. On the other hand, if you have a tight compact neutron star, then it's not squishy. It's, it's um, unlikely to be uh, difficult to be significantly deformed by a nearby neutron star. So of course, if we have neutron star mass and radius observations, we can make a prediction about this neutron star tidal deformability. And so uh, we did this in 2015. And, uh, um, I attempted to use astrophysics units because I thought that's, I thought that's what people would do. Um, so these are this 10 to the 36. Uh, it's about one or two times 10 to the 36 in these CGS units. Okay. So obviously you can imagine where I'm going, but before I go to GW170817, I also, there in 2015, the our equation of state, which didn't have much to say about core collapse, was used in a neutron star merger simulation. Okay, um, and so uh, already uh, in 2015, there were uh, suggestions that neutron star mergers might be, um, this is actually an old story, the Latimer-Schram mechanism, neutron star mergers might be the source of our process nuclei. So, um, so you might ask, well, are our process abundances impacted by the equation of state? And actually it turns out, no, the, the abundances uh, are determined by, you know, in this particular calculation, maybe fission recycling. And so there's, there's not so much impact from the equation of state on the R process abundances. However, the amount of mass ejected in this particular calculation in 2015 was significantly impacted by the equation of state. And this, uh, it turns out, work by Sekiguchi et al. Uh, found that if you use this SFHO equation of state, you ejected significantly more mass than other equations of state, which had larger pressures and larger neutron star radii. So this is kind of cool. It meant that um, our, our new equation of state improved the ability of mergers to produce our process elements, okay? And uh, this was very exciting in 2017 because LIGO observed a double neutron star merger and they measured this tidal deformability, which we predicted in 2015. Of course, they, they used a, a dimensionless tidal deformability parameter called uh, uppercase lambda, and they don't measure the individual lambda of both stars. They measure some combined tidal deformability lambda tilde. But in any case, they, they, um, they verified our prediction, or at least the, the observations which they did and our, our predictions agree. That was, that was nice. But not only that, we also uh, observed a kilonova, and which did offer some support that at least mergers um, do produce some R process abundances. And, and um, we're, of course, excited to see how, uh, how neutron stars will, will teach us nuclear physics in the future. So uh, that's, that's about it. So where are we at here in 2021? Well, now, because not only do we have the mass and radius information, which has been updated over the past 10 years from uh, in uh, neutron stars throughout the galaxy, but also the, the LIGO observation of GW170817. And so we have uh, information on the, the neutron star mass radius curve and the equation of state. We have better constraints on, on MR and the EOS. For example, for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, um, now, you know, 10 and a half kilometers, although acceptable in 2010 is probably ruled out, while 13 kilometers is probably still around, right? Um, 
However, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. For, there is some there's some uncertainty here. We would like to pin down that uncertainty, but also you see that depending on whether or not I choose the left column or the right column, there's there's still some uh, uncertainty, especially in low radii, whether or not this mass radius curve has this positive slope or is vertical, and this is uh, because we're we're sort of data starved, right? There's not a lot of there's not a lot of data points here. And these data points have serious uh, statistical and systematic uncertainties. And uh, one way of saying this is that we're, we're prior dominated. Okay. Um, so at least hopefully I've proven to you that we can use neutron star observations to learn about the nature of strongly interacting matter uh, at, at high densities. And so we've, you know, we're, we're on our way to, to achieving this goal. So uh, what about using neutron star mergers now that, now that LIGO is uh, upgrading and we have uh, uh, further facilities, gravitational wave facilities uh, in, in, the makes, uh, in the making, um, can we use neutron star mergers as a laboratory? And uh, in order to do that, we have to think seriously about the following. Uh, these astrophysical processes like uh, neutron star mergers and core collapse supernovae, they really require nuclear physics input. And we need to uh, do a better job at including this nuclear in physics input. In particular, they need the equation of state, not only the equation of state dense matter, they also need nuclear reactions, uh, all sorts of transport properties. You can think of um, viscosities. Uh, neutrino interactions with dense matter are also difficult and um, neutrinos uh, are an important element in both of these astrophysical processes. So we need to, as, as we did in 2013, you know, providing this SFHO equation of state, we need to uh, update our nuclear physics input for uh, core collapse and, and mergers. So, um, for the moment, uh, I want to talk about the equation of state side. The challenge is that we need to be able to describe uh, the, the thermodynamics of matter over a, a large three-dimensional space. So we have density, we have temperature. Now, I'm since I'm in a merger and a supernova, which are hot, I have to, I have to really think about temperature. And also uh, something about composition. For the moment, I'm just going to, again, assume only neutrons and protons and electrons, no, no quarks or hyperons. Um, but we need to know the, the neutron to proton ratio, which is also uh, uh, sometimes recast in terms of the electron fraction. Of course, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, so the electron fraction is just the proton fraction. Um, so, but inside this three-dimensional space, there are a lot of different physical regimes, and I, I want to list them and go through, uh, go through them here. Um, we have the, the regime of, of nuclei. Uh, densities near the saturation density, T equals zero, um, nearly equal numbers of neutrons and protons. We also have very neutron rich matter, right? Uh, uh, the same density, but, um, but matter in neutron stars and supernova is often neutron rich, right? And so we need to describe that matter, which is not probed by laboratory nuclei. Um, some matter is at low densities and nearly non-degenerate, so we can use uh, different techniques to describe uh, matter which is non-degenerate. We also have uh, neutron-rich matter at high densities, uh, you know, typical of those in the central densities of neutron stars. And then, of course, we have hot matter, uh, which is not, not the same as all of these other regimes you know, 20 MeV for core collapse or even larger, uh, larger temperatures in mergers. And so these different physical regimes represent different physics um, and, then, and then also a different model space. Okay, different, uh, different, nucle you know, different nuclear nuclear interactions or different uh, many body techniques for, for all of these physics regimes. Um, so most equation of state tables, including um, our earlier work have focused on choosing one particular nucleon nuclear interaction and extrapolating. And uh, there's, of course, uh, this is a reasonable way to proceed, but with this extrapolation, you, you might wonder whether or not we really, uh, we're really doing the, the best thing possible for the input for uh, mergers and supernovae. 
So um, what we've been doing uh, for the past couple of years is uh, what I call quilting, an equation of state. And so we use different many body techniques and uh, we constrain the, our, our interactions using different data in different physical regimes. Okay, we try to, we try to use the, the, in each physical regime, we try to use the methods and data most appropriate for that regime. So um, for, for nuclei, obviously we have experiment. And so the nuclei, the DOE SIDAC collaboration, nuclei has used um, experimental masses to calibrate um, a, uh, a set of skirm functionals. And so we, we use exactly the, their, 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 this is actually a Bayesian inference. We used our posterior distribution. For neutron rich matter, um, actually uh, chiral effective theory has proven to be an important tool for um, constructing the nucleon nuclear interaction. And when paired with quantum Monte Carlo, this has given excellent results, um, much better than, than our results in 2012. Um, for, for neutron rich matter um, near, near saturation. So we use nuclear theory here in this regime. Um, now in the non-degenerate limit, we, uh, we know that we can use the virial expansion, a different many body technique, okay? Um, which is based simply on experimental data based on the, neutra, the proton scattering phase shifts. Okay, um, we don't need a sophisticated quantum many body uh, approach there uh, when we can just use uh, sort of semi-classical thermodynamics. Okay, on the other hand, dense neutron rich matter like that uh, achieved in neutron stars, well, there the theoretical models are un unable to really um, to accurately describe that matter with, with any sort of clarity. So we use neutron star observations to the extent that we have them to constrain the equation of state. We pick a phenomenological model and we just constrain it to data. Um, and for, for hot matter near saturation, uh, the, the many body techniques which are uh, best used at finite temperature, which are easiest used at finite temperature are slightly different. So uh, we, we collaborate with, uh, with Jeremy Holt who, uh, who has a particular diagrammatic method which um, he applies to chiral effective theories near saturation density for hot matter. Okay, and so we put these, all, all these all these things together and out pops an equation of state. Um, so obviously this is, uh, for example, we compute the free energy at every point in this three-dimensional space and all of its first and, and uh, first derivatives. Um, I, of course, won't plot that. What I'm gonna plot here is the, is the composition of, uh, of nuclei, the, the average uh, nuclear mass number, the average atomic mass number uh, at, at, as a function of density and temperature. And you see here, this, uh, this is at sort of low densities. You have the liquid, the liquid gas phase transition of, uh, near what would be the crust core transition of the neutron star. The nuclei are, are quite heavy. And then as you, as you go down in density, these uh, nuclei become less and less massive. Um, but then of course the changes depending on the, uh, the electron fraction. Okay, so uh, our particular equation of state also has distribution of nuclei. So this is only the average. There are uh, hundreds or thousands of nuclei participating in the distribution at any one of these points in, in these plots. Okay. <clears throat> so not only this, that um, because of the, the, the way uh, it, we've essentially constructed a phenomenological free energy, Right, but we've also uh, done it with parameters which we can vary. We can treat the equation of state not just as a, as a product, but as a probability distribution. So at every point in this three-dimensional space are our free energy per baryon. Um, this is free energy density and baryon density here. We can, we can construct a, a full probability distribution uh, uh, for, for our equation of state. And so we can say that at this particular density, electron fraction and temperature, our free energy per particle is 70 MeV plus or minus about 10 MeV, okay? And you, see, you can see how this compares that because neutron star radius measurements uh, 
have suggested smaller radii recently, then our, uh, our implied free energy is a little bit smaller than some of the other historical uh, uh, previously generated equation of state. And that's just a reflection of the, the advance of neutron star radius measurements. And so clearly the idea here is that we can continue to uh, advance, uh, refine our probability distributions as, as data comes in using uh, this, this quilting approach. Um, I talked about that already. Uh, and um, this uh, work by uh, my graduate student, Xing Fu Du, um, we have just submitted it. Um, nine equation of state tables are available now. Of course, we have the capability to produce thousands of tables. Uh, but we have limited computational time. So uh, start, start using you know, these nine tables and uh, we, will, we will continue to generate more over time. Um, and of course, we're, we're excited to think about what the uh, impact of exploring these probability distributions, these, uh, the, if we really want to do an uncertainty quantification for the equation of state, uh, what uh, we want to know what the implications are for stellar evolution and our process nucleosynthesis, and also for, for neutron star science in general. Um, so my, my postdoc Zidu Lin uh, and I, uh, we, uh, in, in collaboration with Jerome Margaret, uh, whom I forgot to mention earlier, we are uh, in the process of also taking this, this probability distribution for the equation of state and propagating it through the neutrino opacities for the neutral and charged current processes. So this is Im important because on the neutrino side, there are two fundamental uncertainties, classes of uncertainties. One is that we don't know exactly the neutrino cross sections because we, we don't know the nuclear nuclear interaction. We don't know the equation of state. But also, uh, we, we don't know the neutrino cross sections because we, we cannot, because this is still QCD. And so we cannot calculate uh, these cross sections. Um, we cannot sum the diagrams, sum all the, all the possible diagrams. So we must do something like an RPA, or there are some many Brownian approximation which we use on the neutrino side, and that also induces some uncertainty. And so eventually we want to we want to think about including both of those classes of uncertainties in our, our simulations of these astrophysical processes. So eventually we want to do the nuclear physics of, of multi-messenger mergers. We want to understand neutron star observations, neutron star mergers, both in gravitational waves and in, uh, uh, for example, the kilonova, the, the electromagnetic observations. Uh, and in order to do that, um, of course, uh, we, we, we have our, our small effort, but we really need to uh, coordinate with different communities. Um, there are uh, many of us are experts in the uh, strong interactions and the physics of hot and or dense matter. And so all of these, all of these properties of the equation of state at uh, zero and finite temperatures, neutrino opacities, you know, different, uh, different models of QCD need to go into modeling the physics of dense matter. And then we need to put all of this nuclear physics into the, into the actual simulations. And this is not only a physics problem, but also a a technical problem because we need to generate input, which is useful to the, to the simulation community. So they can simulate neutron star mergers, um, the post-merger, the electromagnetic counterpart, the, the post-merger disk, the kilonova, all of these, these, um, these codes, which perform these kinds of simulations are different and they need to be connected. And then we want to, uh, we want to use these uh, to codes to generate uh, observational signatures to generate gravitational waves and photons, uh, for example, light curves, which can actually be compared to data. And then we need to do the whole Bayesian inference thing to, to go from the green all the way back to the red and connect these observations to learn more about how neutrons and protons work in, in the universe. And, and then also answer questions like the, the holy grail question of the, the core of a neutron star, what is, what is the, 
what are the, the real degrees of freedom in the center of a neutron star uh, and as a function of temperature. So uh, say it in other words, we need to combine nuclear structure theory, low energy nuclear theory, high energy nuclear theory, experiment, um, astrophysics theory, observations, and gravitational wave experiments to, to answer these questions. Um, and so, uh, which is, I wanted to take this opportunity, if you haven't heard of NP3M, a new NSF focused research hub, which, uh, which we just started um, a month and a half, two months ago or so. Um, we, uh, we've got money for the, for the NSF to do exactly this kind of science, to use a neutron star mergers and multi-messenger astronomy to do nuclear physics. Um, and in particular, this homepage, I've taken an old image, it's actually now changed. One of the things which the homepage now says uh, is we're hiring postdocs. So we have, uh, we have several postdoc openings, which we would like to fill on all sorts of aspects of this kind of science. Okay, and so we encourage uh, any of you, if you are or know of a um, graduate student who is about to graduate or, or a postdoc somewhere who is interested in this kind of science and working with the, the NP3M collaboration or a set of um, probably 18 uh, principal and senior investigators uh, working together uh, to, to mentor postdocs to uh, achieve this science. So please, uh, <clears throat> and even if you aren't a, a postdoc, please uh, send me an email and join us uh, and, and let's, let's work on this science together. So I think, uh, I think I'm a little bit early, which I, I don't have any problem with uh, for now. I could, I could go on, but I think it's best to, to give an opportunity for, for you all to ask questions if you have them. Um, so in the future, we want to leverage experimental data, nuclear theory, and observations to, to determine uh, the properties of strongly interacting matter. Uh, so I talked a little bit about the history we're determined we are determining the neutron star mass radius curve in the equation of state of dense matter. We, we predicted <clears throat> the tidal deformability for, for LIGO, and we, we hope to continue to use uh, gravitational wave observations to, to advance science. We're, we're moving to a slightly different laboratory from, uh, from neutron stars, which are uh, not merging to those which are merging, um, and trying to, trying to do nuclear science that way. Uh, and uh, at the, in the second part of the talk, I talked about propagating these nuclear physics uncertainties all the way through neutron star mergers. So we can go backwards and learn the, uh, the fundamental parameters of the, of the interaction between nucleons. I, I think there's a very exciting future for this kind of science um, because not only is LIGO uh, upgrading to be running soon, but we have Cosmic Explorer, the Einstein telescope, uh, on the gravitational wave side, we have uh, nuclear experiment, uh, experimental facilities like Ephraim, uh, Ariel, FAIR, and Spiral. Then a bunch of observational facilities uh, currently running like NICER, um, running in the future, Athena and EXTP and Strobe X, um, other, all sorts of other possibilities. Uh, IXPE, I think I should have mentioned, but so uh, I think this is a, a really exciting time for, for uh, neutron star science and nuclear physics. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you. Thank you for a very nice presentation. So now we'll have some time for questions. Uh, so anybody in the audience, if you have any question, please use the raise your hand and uh, we'll go in order of those hands. So Charles Gale has the first question. Please go ahead. Hey, Andrew, nice talk. Appreciate it. Hi, thank you. Uh, the the PREX value for L is uh, 106, right? Plus or minus some large uncertainty. It's uh, what's your view of the tension between that value and the more traditional ones? Um, so the, um, of course the, what PREX does very well is they measure the form factor at this one particular value of Q squared. Translating that into uh, the value for L is a little, uh, there's a little model dependence in there. And um, I, I think we, um, I think more work can be done to truly uh, understand that model dependence. Um, 
But at the same time, you know, the uncertainties are pretty large. So, right. you know, it, everything, everything's fine. <laughs> it could be, okay. it could be just fine. Right. I, 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 I think, um, I, I really think, you know, with all of these, uh, all of these observations, we just need more. We need to put them together uh, to really obtain a complete picture. Fair enough. All right, thanks. Okay. Next question is Will Giori. Hi. Yeah, that's me. Um, first of all, thanks for the uh, great presentation. That was really great. Um, so I wanted to ask Thank about. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about the. Um, the different physical regimes that you mentioned, like um, neutron rich, dense neutron rich, all those different yeah. regimes, are those relevant at like different locations within each neutron star or different times within a merger or different neutron stars entirely? Or like, how, how does that break down? Yes. <laughs> so that's exactly right. Those those different different physical regimes are probed in uh, at different regions of, of space and time, um, and uh, and then there there also uh, there also is a dependence on, for example, the mass of the neutron star. So low mass neutron stars, you know, don't probe as high densities as high mass neutron stars. That's sort of clear, right? Um, and in particular that that latter distinction is really important because one of the things that's not clear from the, the solitary neutron star merger we have is what is the, what is the population of neutron stars that merge? What, what are their masses? Uh, can, we, can we see two, two solar mass neutron stars merge? Can we see two one solar mass neutron star mergers? What about a merger of a one solar mass and a two solar mass? Like, so uh, the, the probability or the, the population, which represents all these possibilities is, is for example, an interesting question. Got it. Thanks. Okay, next question from Konstantin Maslow. Hi, and uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question to the last probability distribution you were showing a couple of pages back. Yeah, uh -huh. I've done something silly with my, my laptop, which I can't, um, um, oh, it somehow I have this Zoom. Oh, wait, oh, okay, done. now I got it. The, the problem, <laughs> good, okay. All of a sudden, okay, yes, the probability distribution. Yeah, yeah, here. So uh, as I understood it, uh, it was all inferred from just cold neutron star observations, right? So joint constraints from uh, radii and mergers. Well, because uh, no, there's there's um, there's constraints from from all of these different five things, right? So there's constraints from nuclear masses, from from nuclear theory, from scattering phase shifts, from neutron star observations, and then from more nuclear theory. And so, uh, but we are talking about larger densities, right? So we're not talking about just saturation density, larger densities, right? So and, yeah, uh, so we have to. So we there's a. Um, sorry, hopefully I didn't interrupt, but the, there's a large density regime, uh, basically 15 orders of magnitude in density, all the way from the central density of a neutron star to, to very low densities. Yeah, so and, uh, if we are talking larger densities, then uh, the question is how to choose uh, degrees of freedom, as you mentioned yes. a couple of times during the talk. Yeah, and so uh, first, a uh, uh, question about the facts. What were the degrees of freedom in this work? So it's uh, just nucleons or something else? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's just nucleons. So um, there, there are some uh, tables which have uh, strangeness, uh, for example, quarks. And this is uh, something a lot of people are working on. Yeah, so here uh, I just uh, wondered whether hyperons or something else uh, could be included and maybe uh, to use also uncertainties on their parameters of interaction, maybe near saturation density to, uh, to further study the propagation of uncertainties to let's say finer temperature, right? So. Uh, yeah, that's right. All of that, all of that physics is, is important. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, another question is basically to the, to the uh, sketch of uh, NP3M activities. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I noticed everything right, uh, 
could be something maybe missing, but uh, what about the input from uh, comparison with lattice results and, uh, and maybe with a heavy ion experimental program? Programs? Yeah, so, so this, is, uh, this is one of the, one of the great things about NP3M is that we, have, uh, we are strengthening our connections with the heavy ion community. And so we have a couple of experts in, in heavy ion theory uh, on the NP3M collaboration, and we're, we're working together with these people and, and hiring postdocs with them. Oh, with regard to lattice results, we don't, you're, you're right, uh, we don't have any lattice people on the, on the collaboration yet, but I, uh, I think it's important to, uh, to make that connection. The, the connection between uh, lattice and mergers is, um, is the, the strength of that connection is not clear because lattice, as results, as you know, are limited to sort of lower densities. And so whether or not the, the, per, the locations in that MBYET space probe by neutron star mergers overlap those uh, achievable in lattice simulations uh, is not clear. But at the same time, um, this, this could change uh, quantum computing or, or advances in lattice technology. So I, I think it's important to uh, take advantage of that connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Um, then the next question is Pavel Danilevich. Okay. Hey, my question. So, how do you you show the? Um, I'm sorry, Pavel, you're cutting out a little bit. I'm having a difficult time understanding your question. The connection is kind of bad. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm right. No, no, it's okay. Can you hear me now? Try again. Yeah, yes. yeah, try again. Okay, so you, you have shown probability distribution for the free energy, but in your calculations, you need derivatives and maybe even second derivatives of the yes. free energies. How do you combine uh, probability distributions with the um, continue with derivatives with continuity issues. Yeah, so uh, we 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 do compute the first derivatives, and I'm uh, working on the second derivatives. The uh, this is just a a function, right? Um, the 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 free energy is is just some function of all of these parameters, and so I can um, take the derivative before I, I I do the do the Monte Carlo. Right, I can take the derivative of this analytical function and obtain, for example, the entropy, and then also evaluate the entropy uh, as a function of all of these same parameters. So there's no problem with the with the derivatives in the Monte Carlo. So you work with analytic functions and the parameters for rather than any kind of piecewise. I mean, maybe there is piecewise, but with some continuity or something. Exactly. That's I use instead of instead of piecewise. I use um, I use Fermi functions to quilt them together okay. so that they're they're infinitely differentiable. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Uh, actually, the next question is from Henry De Jong. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Henry De Jong here. Thank you uh, for a really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I have sure, a question that. Uh, how does the or how could the uh, neutron star black hole mergers, uh, you know, constrain the equation, the state or the mass radius curves or give you more information? That's uh, that's an excellent question. I I don't know. I need to. Uh, LIGO has just discovered, uh, just observed a couple of these objects. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't, this is not um, a kind of science that I am uh, really familiar with. I think the best thing to do is admit my ignorance. Uh, and say this is something I need to learn. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is coming again from Will Giori. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I had a question about um, one of the plots on, I think, one of the earlier slides where it was um, maybe like a mass radius um, mm -hmm. diagram with curves and the, the one with the horizontal red line that. Oh, the horizontal red line. Okay. Yes, Let we me... had crossed above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, could you explain those regions on the top left where GR, P less than infinity and causality? 
Yeah. Um, so the GR constraint is the um, is a constraint from from the field equations, which just says that any object in that region must be a black hole. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the p less than infinity is is exactly that. Any equation of state in that region must have an infinite pressure somewhere. Not not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and then the causality region is the constraint that the speed of sound in the interior of the neutron star must be less than the speed of light. Uh, the speed of sound in the neutron star must be less than the, the speed of light, not the speed of light <laughs> in the neutron star. Right, right. Okay. Mm. Interesting. So those are all forbidden regions and they're forbidden for different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Got it. Okay, thanks. The causality constraint is the most interesting one, and it's a, it's a really strong constraint on mm. on equations of state. It, um, this this diagonal region is um, it gives you the right idea, but it also uh, it also constrains you from, for example, from coming from the lower right and going too quickly to the right, bending backward too much. By the way, why did you shade it up the uh, bottom right corner? It's not forbidden. Oh uh, no! So okay, the the bottom right corner is uh, is forbidden um, because of because of rotation. So uh, this is from to be fair, this is from Paul Demarest's paper. So the um, there is one particular uh, object which um, uh, which is uh, observing at seven hundred and sixteen hertz. And so if its uh, if its mass is too small and its radius is too large, then it can't exist because a neutron at the at the equator um, the 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 gravitational force isn't sufficient uh, at 716 hertz to keep it down um, right but there are there are stars which will be rotating very very slowly uh second pulsars so they they could easily live there that, that that's right yeah so it's uh it's not a constraint in the in the same way that that these are you're correct yeah okay good um, I think we have another question uh, from Nils Anderson. Uh, do you want to say it yourself or should I read it? Oh, it wasn't a question really. It was oh, more a comment on the neutron star black hole question from earlier because... Uh, oh, thank you. Basically, what the way I recall is that you need the black hole to be quite small, otherwise you don't get any tidal disruption. Basically what happens, the gravitational wave signal just stops. And that's all. Oh, There's yes. no matter, nothing. It's just quite boring. There might be some tidal thing, I maybe, but I think so. I think it, it could be quite disappointing. I don't want to, you know, ruin the parade or anything, but you know. No, thank you. That, that, that makes total sense. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Actually, we have another question I missed. Um, Ramprosa Das, uh, Dos, uh, you had a question. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is uh, neutron stars are uh, paramagnetic or ferromagnetic? Uh, that's uh, so I have, I try to avoid magnetic fields as much as possible <laughs> to be, to be, uh, so I, um, I don't know. I need to, I need to look back at that and to, to give you, uh, to give you a clear answer to that question. I don't remember. Um, at, at least in the regime of low chemical potential, high temperature, that was explored very carefully on the lattice. And I believe it changes from one of the regimes. I believe it's paramagnetic at small temperatures to uh, from diamagnetic to ferromagnetic uh, from small to high densities. And people who do this are people on the lattice. Anyway, but at, uh, I hope that answers your question. At, yeah, but at the center of uh, the uh, stars, I think uh, the core is iron. Oh uh, no, no, the, it's not at the core. Yeah, there's no no nuclei in the core. It's just uh, just in, in many of these calculations, just neutrons and protons or or something else. Yeah. But since they are uh, fermions, actually, there is a tendency to be ferromagnetic. Yep. I don't think that's the answer. It's just a tendency. So take it at, at sort of with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we have another question. Uh, Rob, please go ahead. Yes, could you please uh, just summarize your conclusions about the stiffness of the equation of state, please? 
Um, so I don't, uh, let me see. I'm, our most recent calculation is this 2021 calculation. And uh, I don't remember. Uh, so it depends on what, um, what, what you call stiffness. For example, the, the value of L or the pressure, we have uh, posteriors on these quantities. I guess uh, our, um, our result, yeah, it's, it's moderately soft. Okay, I was just wondering if I missed it. Several groups, who I'm sure you know already, several groups have concluded that you need a very stiff equation of state at surprisingly low densities in order to explain the data, including um, neutron stars with masses above two solar masses. Could you comment on that work? Is that reasonable or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. I, I think the... I think if we um, if we pin down what we mean by by stiff and soft in in some sort of quantitative terms, I think we'll probably um, agree relatively well. It is true that in order to generate a two solar mass neutron star, in order to make sure this this little this little kink here uh, uh, occurs high enough, you you do need a, um, a sufficient pressure um, at at some particular density range. I would define stiff as speed of sound significantly greater than one over square root of three using that criterion. What would you conclude, please? Uh, yeah, so we, we know the speed of sound. We know um, definitively that the speed of sound must be larger than that critical value somewhere in, in, um, in at least a two solar mass neutron star. Okay, great. Thanks. Very nice talk. Enjoyed it very yes. much. Yes. No, sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have another comment from Sophia Han. Uh, do you, do you want to uh, say it yourself? Or do, uh, do yes. You want to... Go yes. ahead. It, this is just a comment and maybe follow up to uh, uh, the question about uh, Newton star black hole merger and also Neil's uh, comment. So basically, there is a work uh, of simulation showing that if Newton star radius is small, then either the black hole needs to spin very rapidly or the mass of black hole needs to be very small in order to produce electromagnetic uh, counterpart signals. So basically there oh, is okay. sensitivity to the US. A large neutron star is easy to disrupt but a small neutron star will be hard to disrupt. So that would affect implications for multi-master uh, signals. Yeah, this is just a comment. Thank you, Andrew, for okay. the nice talk. No, uh, thank you. That's great, Sophia, yeah. Okay, there are some additional comments in uh, in the chat. So uh, if, if you'd like to say them uh, to everybody yourself, please go ahead. Otherwise, I think I'll let people read. In the meantime, um, any other questions? Um, I did have one simple question, very simple question regarding the neutrino matter interaction. Uh, neutrinos interact with uh, matter basically weakly, and uh, I might have misunderstood what you uh, said in the uh, in the presentation. But essentially, the weak loops will be completely irrelevant. It's only the strong interactions that really matter in uh, in these processes. But if we do know the pro uh, the quark distributions in the neutrons, it seems like again the calculation should be relatively straightforward. Am I missing something? Uh, well, I, um, I don't think we know the quark distributions of the nucleons. And so, uh, so at the, at the very least, but then also, um, the, the nucleon is just, is not just a, a, a superposition of valence quarks, right? So I, I, I expect, you know, depending on, um, how you how you construct your nucleon there also of course the the, the gluon C contribution there so I think the um, this is an extremely difficult problem I, for for example neutrinos interacting in quark matter uh, you know um, all we have are sort of mean fieldish phenomenological results right now okay, right. well my my hope was that perhaps the um, uh, Proton proton uh, scattering data might have enough information to provide you that. 
Um, yeah, so pro, the proton proton scattering data works great um, for for low densities where where there's no uh, no impact of a three body force. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yep. Good questions. I, I guess that clarifies. Um, so, any other questions before we wrap this up? I don't see any raised hands. So, first of all, I want to use this opportunity to actually thank uh, Andrew again for a nice presentation. Thank you very much.